Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a fire burning in northeastern San Diego County forces an evacuation of homes. The housing bust has stalled home construction in San Diego, but the city is close to approving a new development along the San Diego River. And the water fight at the Balboa Park Lily Pond continues to make waves in the San Diego mayor's race. While two steam generators remain idle at the San Onofre nuclear power plant, there is new debate over who will pick up the tab. And if you're wondering what's up with the weather in San Diego besides the temperature, of course, we have some answers at the roundtable. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. One of four fires burning in San Diego's Far East County has prompted the Sheriff's Department to issue a mandatory evacuation order. Neighbors in the San Felipe area of Highway 78 and the community of Ranchita are being ordered to leave their homes. A temporary shelter is being set up tonight at Warner Springs High School. Cal Fire reports multiple road closures between Borrego Springs, Julian, and Ranchita. A cluster of lightning sparked fires in the rural northeast county have burned more than 2,300 acres since Sunday. The county information line 211 is updating information about the fire. Meanwhile, the fire burning near Temecula has destroyed one home. Nine homes have been evacuated. The fire started this afternoon. It has burned so far about 1,800 acres. The water fight gone wrong at the Balboa Park Lily Pond continues to cause ripples in San Diego. KPBS reporter Katie Orr has a recap of the latest mayoral debate. The debate in front of the Building Owners and Managers Association was supposed to be about things like the pension and project labor agreements. Instead, the real topic of conversation was what role Republican City Councilman Carl DeMaio's partner, Jonathan Hale, should play in the mayor's race. Hale has a connection to one of the organizers of the water gun fight at Balboa Park. Congressman Bob Filner issued a press release linking Hale to the vandalism charges of the lily pond at Balboa Park. There's no evidence that Hale was connected to the event. Carl DeMaio held a news conference blasting Filner for this news release, and he continued to skewer him today at this debate. But Filner is standing by his claims. He says Hale could play a big role in a DeMaio administration and so should answer some questions. San Diego home prices rose for the seventh straight month in July. A real estate tracking firm says the median price climbed to $342,000 in the county. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson joins us to talk about the housing market. So, Eric, is it improving? Well, it really kind of depends on your perspective. If you're a first-time home buyer out there looking for your first home, it might not be the best market. Analysts say that prices are going up and the number of distressed properties on the market is falling. But if you're a homeowner and the value of your property is going up and there appears to be an uptick in demand for homes, that makes the market a little bit more attractive. And what specifically happened in July? Where are the numbers? Well, the home sales in San Diego County did jump 17.2% over the same month a year ago. Data Quick's Andrew LePage says that's a pretty healthy increase and that year-to-year -year comparisons have now gone up for seven months in a row. Prices also moved up, jumping just over 5% from July a year ago. And LePage says there's more activity in the more expensive neighborhoods as people move up the real estate ladder. And what about the sales of distressed homes? That's another indicator that the housing market's health is getting a little bit better. Short sales, the homes being sold for less than what's owed on the mortgage, make up about 18% of all sales. And foreclosures account for about 21% of home sales. And you say, yeah, that sounds like roughly 40% of all homes changing hands in the distress category. But when you compare that to a couple of years ago, the number was nearly 60%. So you can start to see why observers are being a little bit more optimistic about the market. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson. The addition of Paul Ryan to the Republican presidential ticket helps define the battle lines in November. It could also affect San Diego's congressional races, especially the 52nd district where Republican Brian Bilbray is defending his seat against Democrat Scott Peters. The district runs from Imperial Beach to Poway. Peters believes the choice of Paul Ryan won't be popular with many voters in the newly drawn 52nd district. We're not the most partisan district. We have about a third Republican, a third Democrat, and a third Independent. 
Paul Ryan presents a really kind of a Tea Party approach to government. I don't think that's going to be shared by most of the voters in our district, uh, although it is something that uh, Brian Bilbray has supported in the past. Representative Bill Bray has supported Ryan's federal budget proposal. It includes across-the-board tax cuts, especially for the wealthy, and spending cuts to health care and education. Bill Bray was unavailable for comment. Southern California Edison wants state regulators to investigate before deciding on a request for customers to stop paying to run the shuttered San Onofre nuclear plant. Amitha Sharma has more on the story. State consumer advocates say customers should not have to pick up the monthly $54 million bill for San Onofre nuclear power plant while it remains closed. The group wants ratepayers' monthly payments cut immediately. We put out a request to majority owner Southern California Edison inviting them on the show. They did not reply to our request. Joining me to talk about the issue is Charles Langley. He's a public advocate with UCAN. Charles, San Onofre has been shut down since January after mm -hmm a uh, radio, tiny radioactive leak was discovered in one of its steam generators. Um, how soon can state regulators pull the costs of those new steam, steam generators from customers' bills according to state law? Well, the way the law reads is they should begin doing that at nine months, which would be at the end of September. The, what, the way the Department of Ratepayer Advocates is interpreting this law is they're saying, you know what, they are obligated to stop charging consumers for San Onofre's operating costs right now. They're compelled to do it, and that's very exciting to us. We agree with that interpretation. And why do you agree with that interpretation? Because ratepayers shouldn't be on the hook for a malfunctioning electrical facility. It's one thing if, it, if it's down for a month, but we shouldn't be compelled to pay for something that isn't producing electricity. Not only that, we're paying mandated profits to Southern California Edison and SDG&E for a, a generating facility that's producing nothing. So it's increasing our bills and producing nothing. What's your sense about what consumers are saying about this issue? Uh, have they contacted you, Ken, and said, look, why are we still paying for this? Well, this, this letter is, I, I believe it came out yesterday, so we, we haven't heard too much from our members. But I, I think anyone who looks at this, common sense says it's an outrage. We should not be paying for utility profits on a generating facility that isn't generating electricity. It's like paying for an employee that isn't showing up for work. Well, Charles, San Diego Gas and Electric, which is 20% owner in San Onofre, has weighed in on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, company spokeswoman Stephanie Donovan says, quote, the DRA appears to be jumping the gun. The question about cost recovery for the replacement power for San Onofre will be addressed in the Energy Resource Recovery Account proceeding in the middle of next year. The commission also has acknowledged publicly that will, it will open an investigation in November to deal with the issues surrounding the current outage at San Onofre. Does that satisfy you? No, absolutely not. This is a classic bureaucratic response to a very real problem. They're saying, look, we want to delay any kind of payment on this until the middle of next year while we study the problem. They've been studying the problem for nine months. And what they're complaining about, they're saying they're jumping the gun. Really what they're complaining about is that DRA isn't dragging its feet. The Department of Ratepayers Advocates is doing its job. It's representing the public right now, and they're doing an excellent job, and we agree with their interpretation of the law. The cost of these new steam generators was about $650 million, which translates into about $54 million per mm. month on customers' bills. There has been some talk about fixing these steam generators, which could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Who should be on the hook for that? Well, you know, the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility said the last $30 million safety upgrade to San Onofre ended up costing $3 billion. That's a huge amount of money. So there's a history here of coming in with lowball estimates on a repair and then having the ratepayers foot the bill for incredibly extravagant costs. So the question of whether it should be decommissioned, I think, should be on the table, and it's a legitimate one. Ultimately, it's up to the California Public Utilities Commission to decide this issue. They're generally seen as being friendly to industry. Where do you expect commissioners to fall on this issue? Well, it depends. There's some great 
pro-consumer commissioners on the commission, but it's still run by the former president of SoCal Edison, uh, which happens to own 80% of San Onofre. And historically, that individual has been very sympathetic to the needs of utilities. So we're very concerned that we have a, a California Public Utilities Commission that is inherently sympathetic to the financial needs of utilities because many of these people on the commission have, have a strong utility background. Charles Langley, thank you so much. Thank you. KPBS received a statement from Southern California Edison after the interview. It says, there are existing regulatory processes that are designed to protect ratepayers and ensure power generators address outages safely and efficiently. SCE has been cooperating with the commission and will continue to do so. In San Diego, the housing bust has stalled home construction, yet the city is close to approving a nearly 1,000 home development along the San Diego River. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge tells us some neighbors think the River Bend project is a little too urban. This land between the San Diego River and Mission Gorge Road is an old industrial site which one local resident has called a big pile of junk. That's why some people from Granville welcome plans to create a housing development here called Riverbend when it came before the San Diego Planning Commission. Sherm Harmer is with the development manager, Urban Housing Partners. That this is going to provide a standard, a new standard, a kind of a prototype of what all development should look like along the river. We've oriented the housing to the river. We've put parks and active recreation on the river. It's just unprecedented right now in San, in San Diego to have such a, a development, so we're happy to be the first. Riverbend would be a community of condos and apartments in buildings rising to 75 feet, imagine six or seven stories. There would be 996 housing units, but its big selling point, and the one that caused Rob Hutzel of the San Diego River Coalition to support it, is its five-acre park right along the river. That's a big deal for us. There aren't uh, a lot of park space directly on the river. If you think about it, can you go anywhere in Mission Valley or in Granville and go enjoy in a river experience? No. In fact, the land next to the river in Granville gives no access to the river. It's literally fenced off. But the community of Granville was not unanimous in its support of Riverbend. In fact, its community planning group refused to endorse it. The opposition is based on concerns about the things that more people and greater housing density bring to a place. They include an estimated 7,600 new car trips a day, possibly clogging local roads. I think that the traffic is the worst part of this whole thing. I mean, even in their own EIR, it says they don't deal with the traffic mitigation. And as a person who sits in that traffic and has to deal with that, just trying to take my children to preschool, it's horrible. Then there's the height of the buildings, which the developer originally wanted to be 85 feet. It dwarfs our whole neighborhood. I don't understand how we go from a 30-foot 30, 30 limit that Navajo community planners recommend, and all of a sudden we get to 85 feet. How does that even get in front of you guys? I don't understand it. To understand the concerns about Riverbend, you have to realize this would not be an isolated housing tract. In fact, it's not even the first one proposed for the area. The first was Archstone. Archstone is the name of a planned development of more than 400 homes. It's already been approved, and it's going to be built right here, just one block west of the Riverbend site. Now, Archstone is the first step in a much larger redevelopment plan that could bring as many as 10,000 new homes to this area near the San Diego River. In other words, the development of Riverbend isn't just about the estimated 2,000 people it would bring to Grantville. It's about the 22,000 additional people that could eventually populate the region. Development manager Sherm Harmer defends the height of Riverbend. He says sometimes you have to build higher and block some views if you want to leave enough space for a five-acre park. So when people just think about the issue of height, they're not thinking about the impacts on the ground. And the quality of life can be severely impacted on the ground unless you have enough open space. 
Anthony Wagner is a longtime Granfield resident and a member of the Navajo Community Planners, the group that refused to endorse the River Bend project. He was disappointed that the San Diego Planning Commission approved Riverbend in its current form, but he insists he would support it if community concerns were addressed. I'm not opposed to it. Uh, I'm not opposed to developing this land. Uh, I am an advocate towards developing the land properly. There is definitely one thing Wagner and the developer agree on. Riverbend is a prototype for redeveloping the industrial lands that line the San Diego River in Grantville. But they disagree on whether it's setting the kind of example that should be followed in the many other housing tracks that are expected to take root here in the years to come. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge, San Diego City Council is expected to consider the Riverbend development on September 26th. Students, tourists, sports fans, and people who live and work downtown could benefit from an extension of trolley service next month. About 90 million people a year use San Diego's metropolitan transit system to get around town. Christian Bakelin is a fan of public transit when it works. With gas prices going up and up and up, you know, we can, uh, it's one way to save money. MTS is in the middle of a major project to increase and upgrade its operating system. It includes new station platforms to accommodate wheelchairs and new electronic signs to alert passengers to when a trolley is coming. But Rob Shoup with the transit agency says the biggest change starting in September. Uh, going is the green line is going to be extended from Old Town. It's going to come through Santa Fe Depot and then go well along the base side and terminate here at 12th and Imperial. Shoup says there will be no additional tracks, but the Green Line extension will save passengers time. Whether coming from the East County, Old Town, the gas lamp, or heading to Qualcomm Stadium. The expansion work is being paid for by state funds and a rebound in tax revenue. So when you get right down to it, about a tenth of a penny for every sales tax dollar you spend comes to, to, to MTS. So, you know, the emphasis in San Diego hasn't been on public transportation, but I think we do a phenomenal job. We carry a lot of people and we go a lot of places. Armando Gonzalez rides the trolley and recently moved to San Diego from Orange County. Well, I think it's great because I've never had a problem getting to work or, or you know, any, anywhere I had to get to. MTS is also working on a plan to extend service north to the UC San Diego campus by 2017. The upgrade in September also includes MTS bus service with longer operating hours on the weekends and more frequent bus service on Sundays. If you're wondering what's up with the weather in San Diego, besides the temperature, of course, Amitha Sharma and her guests have some answers. Scorching temperatures have plagued San Diegans for the past two weeks. While there's a brief break in store, expect the heat to make a comeback by week's end. Record hot weather has left many wondering whether Mother Nature's warning signs about climate change are getting more profound. Joining me are meteorologist Alex Tardy of the National Weather Service and Daniel Kayan, who is a research meteorologist for the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Alex, last month was the hottest month on record in the United States. States. How hot did it get? And did that record actually hold true for San Diego? Yeah, it was an incredible month. The month of July, when you look at the whole United States, was the hottest we've seen since the 30s. Um, and to compound that, we're seeing the worst drought across the United States since the 50s. So the two kind of go hand in hand. And for us in San Diego, we've been spared by some of this extreme heat until recently. Um, July did not turn out to be a, a record hot month for really anywhere in Southwest California. August, though, is on pace, especially for our deserts like Palm Springs, to break some records. And here in San Diego, we're running a degree or two above normal, and I'm sure most people have noticed it, or they will notice it when they get their AC bill. And what is the forecast for the rest of the summer? Forecast for the rest of the summer is we're probably going to deal, at least for the next week, with another heat wave building this weekend. We'll have a little bit of relief this week. When we get into September time frame, probably one more good heat wave, not as severe as August, um, and uh, we'll, we'll hold our breath that we don't have a lot of wind during our normal fire weather season. Dan, a lot of us seem to think of climate change as an event in the future, but we're seeing droughts with more frequency. We're seeing heat waves with more frequency. Are the two linked? Are we now experiencing climate change? 
Well, we undoubtedly are. The, the change in the atmosphere, greenhouse gas concentrations have increased uh, markedly from pre-industrial levels. Um, but we're still in the early phase of the climate change phenomena, and in particular this event that um, has set upon us the last week or so, it, it's certainly not the only one we've ever seen, as Alex can, can testify, and we've seen in 2006, for example, we had a remarkable heat wave uh, here in California. But um, it's, it's likely that, that climate uh, warming from greenhouse gases is playing an incremental role. But is it happening faster than we thought? Well, I would say that um, this is probably on par with, with what climate models are projecting. Now, there's, there's a number of climate models. We look at an international suite of models these days, and uh, we look at them under a variety of scenarios. But they are projecting, on average, temperatures to increase uh, by, by at least 2 degrees Fahrenheit by the middle part of the century and as high as, as 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's for an annual average. If you compound that with one of these heat waves that uh, Alex just described, of course, that's going to make things more intense, probably more durable, longer lasting. So um, it's, it's um, likely that what we're seeing is, is the progression of events to essentially a climate that we have not experienced in our historical past. So that means we'll see more frequency of these heat waves and of droughts. What about in the short term, what's coming up this winter? Where do things stand with La Nina, or El Nino, <laughs> I should say? Yeah, either one of those. Um, it looks like the current projections are going to put us into an El Nino for this winter, late fall in this winter. And what does that mean? Well, we'll probably have a higher probability of at least normal precipitation for Southwest California. If the El Nino becomes a little bit stronger, then we have uh, a better chance of seeing above normal precipitation. Um, and that's a good thing because uh, right now we're doing fine because of a wet 2010-2011. Our reservoir supply is, is, is high, but another year of dry like we saw this past winter would, would complicate things significantly. So. At least normal precipitation is what we're thinking now, um, and a high confidence we're going into an El Nino. El Nino is the warming of the Pacific Ocean in the equatorial region. Dan, in about 10 seconds, how would you characterize leadership, political leadership, on this subject of climate change? Uh, I, would, I would say uh, we have a ways to go in terms of uh, showing leadership and um, building our way out of this situation. Dan, Alex, thank you for joining us thank today. You. Tonight in the public square, customers of Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric collectively pay $54 million each month for the operation of the San Onofre nuclear power plant. This week, state ratepayer advocates called on regulators to stop charging customers to run the plant, which was taken offline in January after a tiny radiation leak was discovered. The Division of Ratepayer Advocates told regulators it makes more sense to remove those payments now instead of waiting several more months and allowing hundreds of millions of dollars in needless costs to be borne by customers. Edison, which is majority owner of the plant, says the plant is required to be out of service for nine consecutive months before regulators can investigate whether to make refunds to customers. What do you think? Should San Onofre's corporate operators pick up the tab? Navjeet Sarna wrote on Facebook, yes, let their profits suffer for once. Mandy Barr also on Facebook wrote, absolutely, they are ripping us off for services we are not receiving. You can weigh in on the conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can email us. 
Recapping tonight's top stories, one of four fires burning in San Diego's Far East County has neighbors preparing to evacuate their homes tonight. It's burning in the Grapevine Canyon towards Ranchita near Borrego Springs. Sheriff's Department is advising folks to be ready to leave if notified. It's part of a cluster of fires sparked by lightning. The county information line 211 is updating information about the fire. San Diego home prices rose for the seventh straight month in July. A real estate tracking firm says the median home price climbed to $342,000. That's up more than 5% from a year ago. Short sales and foreclosure made up 40% of the county's housing activity last month. While San Diego is largely spared from the extreme heat plaguing the country in July, the National Weather Service says our temperatures this month are on pace to break some records. And we should expect one more good heat wave in September. Scripps researchers say these hot temperatures are linked to climate change. Their climate model predicts by 2060 these conditions may be the new normal. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening.